Hi, everyone. I have some big news that I want to share with you before we get to our podcast today. I wanted to let you know that Path 11 TV is actually launched. However, we are going to be throwing a party on November 11th at 11 a.m. with Suzanne Northrup. She's an evidential medium, and she's going to be talking with us about mediumship and after-death communication on November 11th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then after that, Suzanne has agreed to give people who sign up for a yearly membership a free gallery reading over Zoom. So the readings necessarily aren't guaranteed, depends on how many people sign up. Um, but once you sign up for your annual membership for $59, we are going to email you the Zoom link to enter into the gallery reading over Zoom with Suzanne on 11-11 at 12 p.m. So we are really, really excited about this. And we decided to discount the annual membership by 40% off the regular price until our launch on November 11th. Once November 12th hits, the price is going back up. So I would really love for you to take advantage of your annual membership for $59. With that, you are going to get free access to a gallery reading with Suzanne Northrup. And you can check out her website if you haven't heard of her yet, SuzanneNorthrop.com. And uh, if, if you sign up before November 11th, you will be able to enter into that Zoom room with her. And hopefully you will get your own reading. So head on over to Path11TV.com. You can register for that annual membership now for $59 and start watching all the content that we have. There's some wonderful stuff on there. I know you're going to enjoy it if you love listening to our podcast. Oh, and by the way, if you've just been listening to the podcast, we have the video um, podcast for Path 11 over on Path 11 TV. So you can't see them anymore on YouTube, but you can watch them for free at path11tv.com. All right, guys, let's get to our show. Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Path 11 podcast. I am very excited to talk to our guest today. It is a totally different subject that I have never spoken to anyone about. We're going to be talking about samurais. Um, so it's pretty exciting, but we're also going to learn about spirituality and magic and the culture of all of this. And it's going to be pretty exciting stuff today. So I am going to introduce you to my guest, Anthony Cummings. He is the author of Ninja Skills and the Ultimate Art of War, among many other books. Uh, the book that we're going to be talking about today is How to Be a Modern Samurai. He's going to turn us into modern samurais today. It's going to be awesome. Um, he is a leader of a project to resurrect the authentic Notori Ryu Samurai School and provide the first English translations of their 17th century training manuals, including the Book of Ninja and the Book of Samurai. So I know, guys, that this sounds like, and like, why is this happening on Path 11 Podcast? But you're going to find out why, because he is going to tie this conversation into really the magic of the samurais, the spirituality of them, and how he has taken what he has learned about the samurais into real modern day world and how we can apply that. So Anthony, welcome to the Path 11 podcast. Thank you very much. Very happy to be here. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your journey. I mean, it sounds like you're taking a huge undertaking um, to want to translate something from, you know, way back when and what got you interested in becoming a samurai. And you're also starting a school, if I saw correctly. Yes. So, oh, you are on a mission. <laughs> so I was born in 1978, which was the ninja boom. It's when everything was ninja Kawasaki bikes and there was ninja this, ninja that. And I was obsessed obsessed with ninja as a child and samurai and I followed all the cliches all the stuff and I tried to get to go to uh, Japan so I finished my first degree got to Japan to train with ninjas and do all that and actually I found out it was quite fake and there was a lot of problems and it was a little bit it just was a bit or not really historical. So I decided to go on a quest to find the truth about it. I got myself a translation partner who speaks 
ancient Japanese and can do all of that. And we put a monk and we've got put people together. And I went on a search of all Japan for all the ninja scrolls, which led me to a larger samurai scrolls, if you like. And then the only thing I could do to really get it out there was obviously publish the books, but then resurrect one of the old schools to try and show people the reality of it instead of the cliche samurai image. Wow. Okay. So we're born just one year apart. So right. um, the Karate Kid is like yep. what I can relate to with this, right? Wax on, wax off. And then, you know, watching it as an adult, it was really interesting, Mr. Miyagi and some of those principles that he was teaching Danielson. Um, yeah. So you really had an affinity for it. You were drawn to it. And so as you were learning this, like, tell me a little bit more about, you know, the principles. I know the samurais were really revered, you know, as these warriors. And um, there aren't any left, if if I recall, in you know what I've learned so far about some of the stuff that. Yeah, I could give you a quick overview of basically the samurai, what they did. So originally, Japan was based on a Chinese system. So all of everything, their Buddhism come from China, their language, not the language, but the writing system came from China, and even the military. However, the people in the court life were doing too many sort of poems and drinking too much sake and little by little they lost control of the country and the army collapsed and what happened then is the people who replaced it were these samurai known as servants they, they used to serve but they took control for a thousand years these samurai very militaristic very disciplined if you like warriors and they all they they're all gone now the samurai collapsed in the 1870s something around there and by world war ii even the families that were associated with being old samurai families had all like all but disappeared and now they just live on the samurai memory so yes the samurai are all gone now but they are much more brutal than we the problem is in the 90s everybody had this idea of the noble samurai and there are aspects of that but they were definitely bloodthirsty, ritualistic magic. You could class black magic and especially headhunting. They loved headhunting. Hmm. Okay. I want to know more. Tell me more about all that stuff. But uh, okay. Well, maybe before we get into some of that, yeah. wh what does it mean to be a samurai? Right. So, like you, you know, in your in your book, how to be a modern samurai. Like, what are some of these principles that you've learned that you're trying to teach people so that they can move through the world and achieve success, reach their goals, have a clear mind, and really live kind of happy lives with using some of these principles. Right. So I've set it up in 10 steps. If you don't mind, I'm going to read the steps if that's yes, okay. Yes, please do. So step one is control your mind. Step two is lead a samurai lifestyle, such as structuring your life and setting your goals and everything. Uh, then you've got to engage strategically with the world. That's the third step. And number four is make your house a fortress. I don't literally mean make it into a fortress, but you've got to put talismans up. You've got to have ceremonial weapons, if you like your armor. I've got it all. And just behind me there is an altar for samurai the old warriors uh they then gotta build an army so you need followers social networking things like that actual groups solid give them um an emblem give them a color give them a motto bring people together same as mcdonald's has it they, it's basically business 101 this but it was done in the ancient ways and i'll explain why it's different uh then you've got to understand the way of war when you go outside of your door technically to a samurai everything is war you've got to be on guard you shouldn't be relaxed that doesn't mean you should be stressed but you should be strategically alert. Um, adopt the way of the ninja. Now, everybody thinks that the ninja and the samurai enemies, that's incorrect. It's historically incorrect. Basically, in a samurai army, there was actually a division of ninjas who used to work within them, and they did espionage. So basically, don't be robbed on the street, know all the tricks, understand all the fake scam emails that come in and all that. Then, of course, step nine is study samurai magic, and we'll go into that, as you say. And then lastly is the spiritual path. You've got Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Shintoism, and you've got to be at a combine all four of those together now the reason is i looked at all the self-help books i've never written a self-help before i've written over 20 history books and my publisher said anthony let's do a, a self-help book samurai ways bring it together and actually many self-help books are good but the difference is is that you've got to stick to them and the way of the samurai gives you a framework that you can put yourself in you don't have to build it yourself you're inside it and there's the ancestors of the samurai came before and they're going to be your descendants for you to leave stuff in the future and if you clash yourself not as a samurai i don't believe people can be samurai but you can live as one then you gives you a much more easy flow to, to pull yourself together and, and focus 
Wow. So step number one sounds like it's going to be one of the hardest control your mind, right? Because that's what people struggle with the most. Um, you know, I work with a lot of people with mental health and people really struggle to control their anxiety, the hamster wheel. They feel like, yeah. you know, if they try to come to a meditation class, I can't meditate. I can't turn off my mind. I can't train the mind. So, I mean, in order to probably be all the rest, you have to have control, a clear mind and focus. That is pro why I've put it as step one samurai without a doubt were even if some of them were violent some of them were a bit over the top because you know they were a little bit cruel at times they definitely had absolute de and the dedication and mental control because it's that about that dual get rid of the dual conversation in your mind first isn't it it's that moment where i always say to people and i use this example and i've used it before in case anybody's heard me speak before is if you give somebody a plate you give them a plate of cake and then you give them a plate of glass and you say which one would you like to eat? It's your choice. And they will always say, well, I'm not going to eat shattered glass. That'll kill me. But they'll eat cake. But we know that obesity kills. We know that high sugar kills. So the actual choice is none of them. They are dangerous. So you have to train yourself to extract yourself from being forced into what you have to do in the world. Step back and think, hold on. One side of my mind saying this and the other saying this. And the reason it picks cake is it thinks that's good for you. And it'll explain. I do it myself. I'm a chocoholic. I love chocolate. I'm like this chocolate, chocolate. And I have to say, oh, I'll be all right tomorrow. I'll diet more tomorrow. No, you've got to stop that side of the brain first. That's mm -hmm. the key. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the stuff that you have in your book, too, it reminds me, I'm uh, reading a book right now by Tim Grover called Relentless, and it's all about mental toughness. And my friends and I, we have this, it's a 75 day hard challenge. And it's basically more of a mental challenge. Have you heard of this before? No, no. Okay. So there's like this protocol that's basically like you have to work out uh, twice a day for 45 minutes, you have to drink a gallon of water a day, you have to read 10 pages of a self help book. So your book uh, helped me to do that. Um, 10 pages of a self-help book. You have to pick some sort of diet. doesn't necessarily have to, whatever it is that you're looking for to obtain. Yeah. So if I'm looking to lose weight, you know, maybe I'm going to drop the carbs and the sugar or whatever. Um, and then you have to take pictures of yourself every day to see your progress. But, you know, the person that is running this, he was saying like, people are going to modify. He's like, just follow the rules. Just yep. follow the rules. Don't don't cheat on it. There's no cheating. And just for 75 days straight. And he's like, and I guarantee there will be like only one or two people that will be able to complete this program because people yeah. don't have the mental toughness. And so when I was kind of going over your material, it made me think about that a little bit about this mental toughness that probably a samurai has and the ability to stay focused and on task because so many of us will have goals, we'll have ideas. We want to reach those goals, but somehow we'll come up with an excuse we'll find a way to maybe decide not to do it change course because it's either too tough or i don't know we're running into conditions that we didn't think you know were yes. possible and part of the 75 day challenge is one of your workouts has to be outside no matter what the weather is and that's to teach you that there are going to be conditions outside of your control but that doesn't mean you give up and you don't stop so are some that's of these actually in samurai life that's called tanren it's hard training for a specific time and it's a historical thing and they used to have uh, if i remember rightly 300 days or a thousand days oh, and they would <laughs> they would go out and train for a year solid or i think it's three and a half years solid and that doesn't mean obviously they don't have a normal life they do but it means getting up getting out there going training and especially if you start something new so we talk about samurai schools everybody thinks samurai schools are only warfare i do a warfare school but there are samurai schools on all sorts of subjects, from language to stars to magic. There's all sorts. And the idea is when you start something, you have to then hit it. So you start slow. And one of the things of a samurai is it's like a fire. Don't quickly try and start a fire with uh, two sticks. Let it glow slightly and then go for it and do a thousand days of training. And after that thousand days of training, you'll be hooked. You'll be addicted and you, to a um, positive life, basically. So start slow, speed up, and then allow it to continue. Yeah, that's kind of what this program is guaranteeing, yeah. that you'll be a different person, you know, it will change your life. And it's more of the psychological, like, like you said, in step one, if we can break through the challenges of the mind, we can really achieve anything. Yeah. What has, have you experienced with your own training, um, you know, with being a ninja and martial arts, um, have you experienced that intensity of type of focus and determination? And do you require that of your students with the school that you are building? I, my, one of the problems I have in life is I'm actually over 
focused and over dedicated people <laughs> tell me off for it i literally don't need to try i have a passion for this a burning inside passion i've spent all my life savings i've been to japan i've burnt through it all and i focus and people just like anthony i need a break and i'm like no no let's keep going <laughs> like translators are burning by the wayside as i'm tearing through them so yeah i don't need that that's i probably need to pull it back a bit mm -hmm. i'll learn that balance really well it sounds like you'd make a great teacher right because a lot of us need what you have um, to get us through life so you know when i was also kind of reading this and learning a little bit about the history my mind automatically went to oh i wonder if anthony was a samurai in a past life because and i don't know what your thoughts are about past lives but i was just thinking like what a unique thing for somebody to be born into the world and then all of a sudden this is like i don't know if obsession is the right word i mean yeah. you're pretty intense about it but but out of all the things that you could have chosen to find inspired inspiration from or to be connected to, it's like you really went into this 100% as if you are the samurai. So do you have any sense like when you stepped on uh, the soil of Japan, did you feel totally at home and connected? Do you think that there's a past life connection for you at all here? Right. So first of all, it's about knowledge or belief. So do we know whether past lives exist and reincarnation? Nobody knows. But do we believe it or what do we want? So I can only tell you what I'd like to be true, what I would like to be true. <laughs> However, there, it has been said by a few Japanese people. They've come up to me and said, Anthony, you are Natori Sanjuro Masazumi, this one man. He's a very famous ninja and uh, he's the man up there on the altar. I've got the uh, death tablet for, if you can see there. Mm -hmm. And I've got everything. He's the man who wrote everything down, 25 manuals of Natori Ryu. And he uh, literally mapped it out. And people have said to me, they are like, Anthony, and these are Japanese people, said, you are Natori, come back to finish your work. Because his death tablet name means the man who gets to the bottom of all education or all things by dripping water onto a stone. You know, and eventually it erodes because they never give up. They just keep going. And that's my attitude. And people in Japan have said, you are him. Come back to finish the work. And I would love that to be true. I'm not going to obviously say that is true, but that would be amazing. And it makes me feel quite happy when they say that. So all I can say is that even though, like I was born in 78, everybody else loved the ninja, but there's only me remaining. So there must be something there. And when I'm not in Japan, I genuinely feel like I, I'm not at home. I should be in Japan. But of course, it's a, it's a tricky life. Keep going there and it's very expensive. Right. Yeah. Okay. So um, tell us more about the magic. Okay. Samurai magic, because, you know, you're talking about the altar. It reminds me a lot of, I don't know, just um, like shamanistic practices usually have an altar. You dedicated to the ancestors. There's a picture of the ancestors. Um, you know, some of the stuff that you talk about, I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I, I do this already. And I have this stuff. I have my altar at home and I'll make my little talesman and, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, when we when we honor the full moon or the new moon we're putting crystals out or we're setting intentions you know that can be a yep. bit of a spell per se um so yeah so tell me a little bit more about the samurai magic right so samurai definitely have magic they are very so what you've got to realize is they're humans who have been trained since birth to be probably really good at war or their subject but they live in a medieval society where they absolutely believe in demons magic um, other entities that is not a problem for them that they believe this of course they use now this is confusing when we use say like the lord's prayer in christianity and the cross they are very similar things their main religion is there and they have uh, symbols that they use on their armor and uh, especially on like the front here and they'll have different things to get rid of evil forces but they also will do spells on paper and then they'll screw them up and maybe eat them or place them inside or lacquer them on the inside of their armor there are spells on the blades of their swords there are certain ways when you activate a sword that you will like um talk about fire and put it over fire and bring fire into it of course the ghosts of the ancestors are a big big thing the ancestors are always looking after you in japan and if you want after this bit we'll talk about the four spiritualities because that's connected to mm -hmm. this because you have a uh, buddhism and shintoism sort of clash but the japanese don't mind so in 
and in Taoism as well, basically the spirit divides into the spirit that goes up and the spirit that goes down. In Buddhism, it goes on to the next life. But um, in uh, Shintoism, it becomes your ancestor. So you ask a samurai, you could go back in time, what what actually happens after life? They, they probably say, I don't, you know, it's four <laughs> different ways that all, nobody questions that they're all different, but they all happen at the same time. So they are well aware that the idea that there are ghosts in the land, their ancestors are watching them, and that whoever they kill, they have to protect themselves against. So when a samurai kills someone, you have to decapitate them. So you kill, take the head, and then what they do is they actually tie the head on because some of the samurai will try and steal the head you've got. And when you go along, you say, this is the head I've taken. And they have to, before they give it to the law to say whether it's a, the correct person or what level it is, like if you killed a really high ranking, they have to check it or put the tongue away, pick the eyes correctly, then blacken the teeth because that's noble, and then oil the hair. And then they present it. But if it's an evil head, they've got spells to get rid of it and banish the ghosts and the certain banishing rituals. Oh, I could go on for ages, but you know, you get the idea. They are, it's a gruesome, but it's definitely magic based. Now, if it's magic based like that, there has to be somewhere an experience that happened to make them believe that they had to carry out these traditions and rituals. Um, a lot know. of it came over from old China, actually, because don't forget, you've still got the suicide. So in old China, they used to bury people alive in uh, tombs to go on, um, you know, there and that tradition came across to japan where they now they used to cut their stomachs open you must harakiri and seppuku and they follow the law to the afterlife so that's another dimension to the undead you know or the dead if you like that they then go on to follow their lord and they don't get reincarnated so probably a lot of this came from china okay. and that's how it built into the japanese psyche but without doubt they believe they encountered um evil spirits and good spirits and all of that without doubt and so what are your personal experiences with that or thoughts about that? Let me start with, like, do you do any rituals with your swords or have you written any spells or if you're going to, I don't know, do you have, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about my friends who are in a dojo and, you know, they will have sparring matches when they're testing for their belts. So I'm assuming you've yeah. done stuff like that. Do you carry on any of these traditions, any of this spell work with, with your materials or with your classes? So what I do is I have to absolutely divide my life into my work, what I do, and my personal beliefs with what I do. So because my followers are there for pure history, you know, even if it's magical and spiritual, they want to say, well, what happened at this date and what did that do? And then so when it's I'm presenting my books, everything's very historical. But when I'm running my classes and the people have turned up, you know, it, it's actually all over the world. And we chat with each other like this. And we I go and visit them and sometimes in America and they will say, OK, let's do the rituals. So sometimes when I've sent things for my own personal one, like I've sent letters before, I've actually placed the letters with a certain folding ritual that should get more power and help make the request in the letter happen. I obviously maintain the altar and there are rituals such as if you're going on a long journey, like we would pray to St. Christopher a long journey, you actually do the Kuji rit or Juji ritual, which goes Rin Pyo Tosha Kai Jin Retsu Zai Zen. And then you write the little ideogram you want to travel. If it's over water, you write a dragon. If you've got to go into a business meeting, you write that. And then you send that into the universe to, to help protect you. It's again, an old Chinese thing where it says, bring my soldiers and of ghost soldiers behind and protect me. So I will do that type of thing, yes. Awesome. But I do, I do divide between to make sure my work is always historical because I don't like the idea of putting there people, you're putting my beliefs on historical translations. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, I get it to keep that separate. Yeah. yeah. So a little bit of those examples, it reminds me of uh, Reiki with the Reiki symbols. So there's, you know, symbols now they're they've been written, but they used to be traditionally passed down from teacher yeah. to student. And but there there's like a distance healing symbol. And if you want to heal somebody, it's like, you know, you can draw that symbol on a picture on a name, you send it out to the universe. Um, if you're looking to manifest things or to even heal things in a past life, there's a certain symbol that you can use to send back back in time or into the future to be able to heal. So, you know, I'm kind of digging this. I'm, I'm getting some of it. I'm seeing some similarities with the two. You know, I live the in the smallest village in the world. I came from a city, but I live with only a hundred people in this village. And there are two Reiki masters in the village. Wow. <laughs> Random is that. And uh, me, a Japanese guy. And there's like literally, and a guy who lives down the road has a Japanese wife. It's like the, the Japanese village in the middle of Wales. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's going mad with Reiki here. Yeah, but yeah. I have seen the Reiki and they, uh, I've seen it and they transmit things and there's lots of rituals for transmission, isn't there? And all yes. that. Yeah. 
Yep. So let's go over those four um, spiritual principles. Can you kind of like define each one and uh, go into a little bit of depth of each? Right. So in Japan and China, normally it's known as the three great religions, but there's actually four in Japan. So I'm going to do this. The only way I can explain it to people is do it in concentric circles. So let's start pretty much at the, uh, the, the middle. So Taoism is, or Taoism, by the way, it doesn't matter which way you say it, Tao or Tao. It's actually in the middle somewhere. It's like Tao. And, you know, <laughs> but you'd sound a bit strange if you kept saying it. So people argue about that, but it's not a problem. So that's the idea of your position in the universe. It's yin and yang. In the beginning of the universe, yin and yang moved and, cre oh, sorry, the universe moved and created yin and yang opposites. And from that, it mixes and 10,000 things appear and you are one of them. Your existence in the universe is a mixture of chi energy or ki. And that idea is the fact that Taoism is about you in the middle of the universe and how you should interact with yin and yang and the landscape there. Now, down a bit further is actually uh, Confucianism. And that is about how you interact with the people around you so people try to read confucius and then they get struggle with it because it's very chinese-esque and you know there's lots of stories that only make sense if you live in ancient china but what he's actually saying is go to funerals wear the correct clothes at weddings do the correct thing when you meet someone like your boss meet them properly so it's about protocol in society but of course they worship him as a god now as well uh, then you get buddhism which is about your internal mind you go further down and it's about am i going to be reincarnated what is my karma how should i deal with that what what's my behavior and then it, so that gives you you from the universe to society to your brain but then you add shinto which is your position in history where are my ancestors who's coming after me and you know the landscape itself is moving through time and that is my opinion why they work together really well christianity islam sometimes argue judaism they all argue because they're so close but the others these in japan are so far away but they complement each other quite well because they don't tread on each other's feet so much Mm, okay, that that was a really easy description to follow. Thank you. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this question too, because you were talking about in kind of the 10 steps, like when you um, walk out of your door, right, you kind of have to be prepared for war. And um, I have a good friend that was a ninth degree black belt in karate. I'm not sure of which lineage. Um, but I would kind of like tease him a little bit. And I would say, well, it almost seems like you're living like a fear based life, like you're always yeah. anticipating and waiting and ready. And he was like, No, it's not so much fear. It's just always being prepared and doing the right thing. Like, you know, he would say, um, if he saw somebody coming down the street, he's more inclined to just cross. So he doesn't have to have that interaction. So it's always like anticipating beforehand. And he says, you know, kind of once you know how to use it, the goal is to not never have to use it unless you need to. Um, so I kind of feel like even though we're kind of talking about war and decapitation and, you know, ripping people's stomachs open and stuff like that, where it can sound so gruesome and violent. Um, I don't know if there's some of the same principles of that, of where it's like you hold this, but it's, it's not for use um, and like the knowledge of what, you know, and like for karate and how to fight, it's not like you're going out there picking a fight and you want to just be at war with all people. It's more like being prepared. So I, I want to ask you that same question too, because it just seems like opening up the, up the door and preparing for a war or being prepared. I'm like, Oh my God, what, can't you just walk out the door and feel love? <laughs> and <just> be like, <laughs> relax? <laughs> Most within two minutes. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. So it uh, depends on where you live. I suppose that doesn't, there. True. Well, yeah. it's it, i agree with you when you first look at it and it's the same as when you still look at like buddhism and all of the way of death and what's going to happen you can become intoxicated with death and danger and violence but actually it's about reprogramming your mind so when something physically attacks you martial arts you're meant to reprogram the way you go instead of just ducking and covering it's meant to retrain attacking them but when you train your mind what you have to do is prepare yourself to anticipate things three steps ahead so it isn't a stress for you. Or oh, I've got to this position in life and I've I realized I'm in a dark alley and I don't know why I'm here and there's some people at the end and I don't have my phone or it's not charged. You know, there was that it's about just being a three steps ahead. And when you've got it sorted, you react instantly. So he'll see the man walking down the road. And this is actually from samurai teaching. They say, even though you're a samurai, even though you can kill people and all that, 
don't go to a place where you're going to have trouble. That's a stupid idea. Just walk so another way around. It's perfectly fine. You're not a coward. It means you're just like, I'm not going to deal with that. That's fine. But the, the big line here, the line between old samurai ways and I suppose the modern karate aspect is you have to choose when to react. So if you don't react, you become a coward. So if it's a case where you can get out of it and you've not a problem, but if you're suddenly, you know, you, you should react or you should stand your ground, then stand it, even if you die. Hmm. That's their motto. That's their thing. Okay. So it's actually quite good. And the other thing is people ask me, what is, so there's a word in Japanese called gungaku, and it means military study or gunjutsu, the military skills. And people say, what are they? And I could spend hours picking out individual ones. And the actual truth is there's probably in my school about 10,000 individual skills, literally 10,000. And the idea is you remember them or training them over and over again so that you can react to any situation in the correct way. So, for example, I'll give you an example. The other day I failed in my training. I actually genuinely failed. So I'm in a small village and I could see a flashing orange light outside. And I look out, which is rare here, look outside the window and there's a van pulled up switching my neighbor's tires off. They're pulling my neighbor's tires off in the dark. And I'm like, mm, that doesn't sound, uh, my neighbor can do his own tires. Who are these strange people? So samurai teaching would say, you don't know if they're doing the right thing or wrong thing. You don't just attack them. You ask them a question, but with a misleading answer. So the, the neighbor is called Carl. So I should have said, hi, are you working for Steve? And if they say, yes, I'm working for Steve, you know, they're lying. Mm. So then you're prepared for what's going to happen. But I made a mistake. I came out with just without thinking, I said, are you working for Carl? And if they say yes, I can't pursue it anymore because that's the truth. So I, I made a mistake in that training. And that's the point is you, you, work, you prepare yourself for all situations so you can pick that skill out of nowhere and do it. Uh, well, what happened? I have to know. <laughs> well, luckily, the, tires or what? So the moment it turns, they turn around and went, yeah, we're working for Carl. It's okay. And I thought, oh, I've made a mistake. They've just, I've done exactly what my school said don't do. But luckily down the road, because Carl lives down the road, he shouted, thank you, Anthony. Yep, they're with me. It's okay. So okay. otherwise I'd have had to go out the back, come round, knock on his house and say, are you sure them? you know, are they all right? So, right. so I didn't embarrass myself by going check in. So it's about keeping the other person's honor as well. So there's about five different lessons there. Maintain the other person's honor. I stayed within the gates of my house because if they attack me, if they're thieves, I can defend myself. Change the name of the person. There's all these skills go in. And if you get it right, your life's easy. It's not yeah. a stress. So you've been training in this forever. So other people that have trained in it and maybe have made a similar mistake, what do you think that was, right? Because I would think that most of what you've learned right now is secondhand, just like a part of life that you probably don't even have to think about. But in those moments of lapse where it's like, oh, shoot, I should have changed the name. What's happening in that moment for you that you think you forgot? Is it just human error like it just happens oh, totally human error and the the idea is that this what it's one of the fundamental things about my work is to get rid of the misunderstanding of samurai that's absolutely it so one of these misunderstandings that they're the perfect warrior they get everything right they never step to the side they're honorable they present that was not true they are humans they were brutal they had their own problems they would drink there was a lot in fact it was a lot of 25 year old lads with alcohol and swords <laughs> it's, it's what actually it was so there's issues so all i do is step back and say okay you've made a mistake and i made a public video about this for my students and people are saying oh Oh, that's a good point. And it, we learn from it and just re and probably when we get together, I'll do an exercise to just go through that again. So I get it back in my mind. Now, are your students people that have always been like connected to Japan or the ways of ninjas and stuff like that? Or would it be like people like me that like, how would people like me necessarily benefit from working with you or coming to your school, your training? Because all of what you're saying is like in line with a lot of what I believe and what I feel. And it sounds exciting. And I'm like, yeah, I want to do this. Um, but had I not like stumbled upon your book, I don't know, thinking about the teachings of the samurai or who they were or what they did never would probably have even have crossed my path or would have been something that I would have thought about. So how do you kind of take what you've learned and what you've studied and turn it into more of the mainstream of people that really aren't turning their eyes towards this? I actually have a guy who helps me called Andrew Throwburn and he's, he's a really good lad and he runs all the courses for me because we're not all in the same area. So he runs these online courses and, uh, it's like a university. You pick which course you want to do. So some people love stars and um, 
not astrology, astronomy, but there is astrology included, so but astronomy as well. And they actually will go out at night and do everything and track the North Star, learn how to cross rivers and do mountaineering type stuff. Some people go down the fitness route and it's all run from this one guy there. So everybody comes. So if you're listening to this, the information's all in the back of the book, guys, by the way. It's in there and we you need to go on Facebook and look up Natori Ryu Hub, H-U-B, and then you can get involved there. But generally, most of them are from a samurai background. You are right. Most of them come across me because they're already in a dojo somewhere. They're already doing some swordsmanship. But I have actually got a lot of online hate because I actually am trying to, in Japan, what a lot of people don't realize is the samurai schools went through a big change in the 20th century and they put forward this idea of peace, especially after the atomic warfare in World War II and the Japanese in World War II. They then presented this idea of this honorable, wise people instead of the bloodthirsty World War II Japanese that happened. So it changed a lot of things. So I come into conflict with a lot of Japanese schools and a lot of problems there because I'm trying to say, well, actually, this is the truth. And they said, well, you're English. You don't know. So I set this up so people can just pick their course and get as involved or not involved as they like, really. Okay. And now you're saying you're saying that people have to find you on Facebook to get into the course, or do you have a website that they can go to to select? So I think I was went to your website, and I can either like read about you or go into the school. So basically, I personally am not on Facebook, actually, believe it or not. But the the school is run through Andrew on Facebook. But the best thing you can do, guys, to follow me is just look up my name. It's Anthony Cummins. Uh, there's no H and there's no G. And uh, basically, find me on YouTube and everything is there. And you'll see I put up videos at least once or one every two days. And then I can direct you to wherever you want to go. It's no problem. And of course, my website is www.natori. Now, this is N. A T O R I dot co dot UK, not dot com. That will take you to a woman's lingerie uh, <laughs> thingy, so don't go there. So it's actually a Japanese family who are in the fashion business who have natori.com. So uh, they, 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 you come up with knickers. So uh, don't do that. So come and visit me. But you're right, there's me and there's the school. You can jump between both websites, both on there, and it'll explain everything. But I'm always open for questions when you get that far. Wonderful. Well, Anthony, thank you so much. This was um, really awesome. I love your energy. You're so fun to listen to. I feel like I could sit and be your student and just, you know, absorb so much. And it's it's really great stuff. You know, it's something totally different, which is why I thought it would be really nice for the Path Love and Podcast to expand our listeners' views about something that we've never really talked about here on the show. So I wish you great luck. I am sure some of our listeners are going to head on over. Um, hopefully, they'll mention that they heard you on the Path Love and podcast and uh yeah check it out and we'll put uh these links in the show notes as well that's perfect thank you very much guys obviously help support me get the book that would be wonderful and i can get back to japan and find more scrolls which is always good thanks again for listening everyone i hope you enjoyed that show and don't forget to head on over to path11tv.com grab your annual membership for 59 dollars. remember that is 40 percent off the regular price once November 12th hits, the price is going to go back up to the regular price. So I really want you to take advantage of our launch deal of $59. You get over 75 hours of content that we have on there. And if you register now until November 11th, we are going to email you a private link to the Zoom gallery reading with Suzanne Northrup. And if you would like to watch Suzanne and see what she has to say before the gallery reading, you can tune in to Facebook Live, YouTube Live, or watch it on path11productions.com. She's going to be speaking for about 30 to 45 minutes on November 11th at 11 a.m. We're going to take a short break, and then you are going to head on over to your Zoom room and sit there in the gallery, and hopefully Suzanne will choose you and give you a private reading to connect with your deceased loved ones. So head on over to path11tv.com. Take advantage of the annual membership. Remember the monthly membership does not give you the zoom link. You have to purchase the annual membership in order to get into the gallery reading zoom room. All right, guys, take care.